Sure? Are you positive? If you said Deborah, you're correct. <laughs> the next question is, name the wife of Boaz. Jezebel, Esther, Ruth, or Mary? And again, A, B, C, D. If you said Ruth, you are correct. Good job. The next question is, who was the oldest cousin or older cousin? Jesus or John the Baptist? Five, four, three, two, one and a half. What? If you said John the Baptist, you are correct. All right, my favorite question. Which of these is not a book of the Bible? Obadiah, Zephaniah, Hezekiah, or Zechariah? So, so happy you're all here. Um, whether this is your first time at church, your first um, experience with something like that, welcome. We want to make sure um, you just really feel what we're about tonight. Um, so we're with How To Life Movement. This is a worldwide movement um, led by Gen Z for Gen Z, but we're reaching out to people of all ages, which is so awesome. Um, if you guys just want to stand with me. So as we get into worship, I just encourage you to have the perspective of what would you give God if this was your last time being like ever being able to worship Him? If this is your last day on earth, um, would you be satisfied with everything you gave Him? Or would you have wished that you gave Him more? Um, so just as we start worship, I'm going to pray here. So God, we just thank you so much for bringing all of us here tonight. Jesus, I just pray that you would um, be here, be in this place, God. We're here for you. We want more of you. We want to learn about you. Um, just come make yourself known. Come stir in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Cool. Um, I don't know who you are. I'm thankful y'all are here. Um, if this is something you're used to, um, welcome. If this is something completely new to you, if you don't even know what worship is or who Jesus is or like whatever, um, man, so thankful you're here. Um, we're so glad to have you. Um, yeah, worship how you're comfortable. Let's give praise to the Lord.
for coming so we're gonna welcome up our first speaker uh, his name's Aaron he's from yeah uh, so he's from Minneapolis and you might have seen him on like TikTok or that kind of stuff he's a Christian social media influencer and he's gonna share his testimony what's up everybody um, so yeah I'm really excited to share my testimony for the second time here now um, <laughs> yeah so um, I want to start off with this, this idea that maybe you haven't heard, maybe you have heard that, um, you know, there's people who, out there who think, you know, man, my testimony's kind of boring. You know, there, there wasn't this crazy stuff, you know, I wasn't addicted to hard drugs or I didn't go out to all these parties and do all these crazy things and that means my testimony isn't as powerful as someone who did go through these things and, you know, maybe that's you. But I want to tell you right now that the content of your testimony isn't what gives it its power. What gives your testimony power is the fact that God has redeemed you from the things that you struggled with. The fact is, is all of us, we're all sinners. We all need the grace of God. Whatever sin it is that you struggle with, we all need his grace. And um, with that in mind... Um, I'm going to start off my story with the infamous phrase, I was raised in a Christian household and, um, you know, I went to Sunday school, I went to church for um, years and um, I just had this, this belief in Jesus. I believed in God, you know, every time like we talked about believing in God, I was like, yeah, I totally agree, you know, but I lacked that genuine faith in Christ. You know, I knew God existed. You know, there was no denying that. But I didn't trust in Jesus. I didn't have this faith. The faith in Jesus that says, you know, I believe what you did for me and I believe that what you did is enough to save me. But I just believe that he existed. And, um, you know, this... This head knowledge, you know, um, James, uh, in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 19, he says, you believe God is one, you do well. The demons believe that and tremble. So my belief in Jesus was the same belief that the demons held in Jesus. And so this head knowledge, um, you know, led me to do some, some sinful stuff. It led me to live out my fleshly desires. And so... Um, by sixth grade, I was introduced to pornography for the first time, and that turned into a, a terrible addiction um, for, for years, and something I never thought that I would ever be free from. Um, and by seventh grade, I, um, I met some, some friends, and the reason I say friends is because they didn't really care about me. Um, they were really hurtful with their words, and um, one day, one of them was very hurtful with their hands. Um, there was one day, uh, the teacher in math class left the room, a bunch of male middle schoolers alone in a room. And um, this friend of mine that I thought was close with, I thought he cared about me a lot, and I cared about him too, and um, he, he started 
messing with my stuff. He took my stuff away and I did what anyone would do. I got up and I took my stuff back. And he didn't like that very much. So he slapped me upside the head just as hard as he could. Like it made me bend over like that. And my ear was ringing. And, um, you know, everyone was laughing. You know, they, I was humiliated. And at the time, you know, there was no way I'd ever hit anyone back because I was afraid that my parents would punish me and take away my precious Xbox. And, you know, there was just so much fear of that, that punishment. So all I could say is, why would you do that? And, you know, in that, I obeyed my parents, but in my heart, I was angry and I hated him. I hated him. I did not want to obey my parents in that moment. And even though I did obey my parents, it was still sin to me. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, uh, 27 and 28, says, you heard, do not, you heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that if you even look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. So Jesus doesn't just care about what you do. He, he looks at your desires. And if you desire sin, that isn't, that's not going to slide. So in my heart, this hate and this desire for him, this genuine hatred for him to be dead was, was not okay. And um, I, I needed a new heart. I needed, I needed my heart of stone to be removed and replaced with a heart of flesh. And that's God's promise in Ezekiel 36, 26, that he will remove... Um, the heart of stone and remove and replace it with a heart of flesh. And so, um, you know, at, at the end of seventh grade, I, I, I genuinely did not want to be alive anymore. Um, I, I didn't feel like there was any point. Um, and, you know, no one, no one cared about me. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have anybody to talk to really. And um, my parents forced me to go to this Bible camp. <laughs> Great. That's like the first thing I wanted to do. You know, and so I go to this Bible camp and lo and behold, everyone is just so nice to me. And for the first time I'm treated with love and respect and I'm like, wow, there are people out there that care about me. There's people who are willing to just show this simple love and kindness that, you know, it's just human decency. And um, that that little act of all these people made me realize, wow, maybe this life is worth living. And so in that, I feel like some people sometimes will say, you know, if I don't reach every single person I can and I don't do, I don't speak to every single person I see about Jesus and I'm not, I'm not always in it, you know, I just want to encourage you in the fact that the littlest things can have the biggest impact. For me, it saved my life. And so, fast forward to high school. Um, it was ninth grade Spanish class. My teacher asked, um, you know, a pretty normal question. She said, where do you guys see yourself in 10 years? And I said, I don't really know. I want to die young. So even though, you know, I was still alive, I still didn't want to be alive very long. And um, she, she didn't do anything. You know, she just, she just kind of, wow, that's sad. And we kept learning how to conjugate verbs in Spanish, you know, what you do in Spanish class. And so, you know, but what could she do? What could any person do? The, what I needed was God to intervene in my life. So fast forward another year, my sophomore year of high school, it was, it was um, the Christmas time. Family and I just got home from a, a really fun Christmas party at my aunt and uncle's and, um, my brother, my brothers and I have this, had this mutual struggle at the time with pornography. It's, it's very prevalent. Um, and my oldest brother sat me down on his bed and he, and he, he asked me, he said, what do you have in your life that you need to repent of? And I said, huh? I've never heard that word before. Can, can you, you said, re Repent? can you explain what that word means? And he told me, well, to repent is you're, you're living in your sin. You are 
you need Jesus. You need, you need to be saved from this. You need to be, you, you're in sin and you need to turn to Christ. And you need to, you need to focus on him. You need to put your faith in him. You need to trust in Christ. And, and I was like, I want to do that. You know, nothing in my life this far has sounded worth living but this Jesus guy who promises joy and peace that surpasses all understanding and, and, and love and true fulfillment. I, I had to give it a try. There was nothing else that, that fulfilled me, so why not just try another thing? And so for the first time in my life, I put my head down on a pillow and I, I genuinely prayed. I prayed to God and as I was praying, I just, I just heard this word echoing in my mind over and over, surrender. To surrender to Christ, surrender my life to him, surrender and put my full trust in him that he died on the cross <clears throat> and that he was buried and that he rose again all for me. It was him who took my place on that cross. He went before the Father as if he were me so I could go before the Father as if I were him. He is righteous. I am unrighteous. But he traded his righteousness for my sin. And on the cross, it was crucified with him. And I put my trust in that. And now that my trust is in him, <laughs> there's nowhere for me to go but heaven, eternity with him. Spending eternity with God in heaven. And the day before that and the day after, I can tell you, genuine joy and just lost. And I, I ran with that. I grew in that. And, and something, you know, before, I had never read the Bible. I never knew John 3.16. That's like one of the, that's the most popular quoted Bible verse. I didn't even know it. And I hated reading. Like my mom would always be like, hey, you should read this book or, you know, read this book. And I, no, I just want to play Xbox. I want to watch TV. I want to do cool stuff. Books are dumb, you know. And, <laughs> and um, I, I all of a sudden had this, this desire to read the Bible. And I, I, I got deep in scripture and I learned about God. And, and I ran with that and, and it gave me peace. And, you know, I just, I, and, and going back to porn, that, that was something that I thought I would never be freed from. And, and today I can tell you with a smile on my face that I'm eight months free from that. All by the, all by the grace of God. And so I want, I want if, if you listen to anything I said tonight, I want you to hear this, that there is no sin too great for God's grace to forgive you. There is nothing in your life that is too powerful, that has too much a grip on you that God cannot forgive. He will forgive anybody. You may think in your head, I'm the worst person who's ever existed. But Jesus can forgive that. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for sharing. Uh, it's just awesome how you put all your trust in God, and uh, he freed you from all your, from your uh, addictions and sins, so that's awesome. Um, we're going to have our next speaker come up, uh, Gracie. So she's, uh, she's a part of How to Life in Kansas City, and she's, <laughs> yeah. and she's the new and upcoming president for um, How to Life Movement in Kansas City, so yeah. Right, well, thank you guys. All right, so I just want to thank you guys for all coming tonight. Um, whether you planned or not, that just shows your obedience to the Lord. Um, and that just shows whether you were dragged here or you wanted to come. Um, I just, I pray that you have an open heart and open mind whenever you hear not only my story, but everyone's stories tonight um, and everyone's messages. So I will start out with growing up, um, I never really grew up in the typical Christian household, I guess you could say. Um, the only time I really went to um, church was on Christmas and Easter, and that was it. Um, and so I heard the name of Jesus before. I kind of knew what Jesus was about, but 
that was it. We never went home and we never furthered the discussion. We never talked about it at the dinner table. We never prayed before any of our meals. Um, and so that was it. And so growing up, I always had this curiosity of like, well, you know, like what? Like what? What am I here for? What is my purpose? Why? Why am I here? Like I have all these fun things around my friends, but at the end of the day, why am I here? And so, you know, as I kind of started growing up around the age of nine or ten, um, my parents started having a lot of <laughs> thank you, a lot of difficulties, um, and they started getting in arguments and fights almost every night. And I remember being in my bedroom um, at night, you know, ten years old, and I would think, look, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if I'm praying to someone. I don't even know what a prayer is. But I said, I just need to be saved. I said, I need someone to love me for who I am. Because I didn't feel loved where I was. And I was only 10 years old, guys. Um, and so, by the grace of God, um, my older sister and my stepsister, um, her and her husband decided to take me and my younger brother in um, when I was 11 years old. And she decided to take us into her home. And, you know, she saw what our life was like. And she saw that we were in a really negative household. Um, and so she decided that, you know what, I'm, I'm going to give these kids a home, even if it's only for a little bit of time. And so I went to go live with her for the summer. And she started taking me to church. And I remember I showed up the first time. And I was really, really confused. I was like, why are all these people's hands up? Like, who is this Jesus dude? Like, I've heard the name, but like, I don't really know what that means. Um, and so I, I went home and I said, look, I don't, I don't know what happened today, but I felt a love I've never felt before. I said, I felt that there was someone out there for me that said, come to me as you are, not in a fancy dress, not with perfect parents, not with, you know, a good attitude all the time, but just as you are, because I will love you just as you are. And so I, I was like, I don't know what this is. And she was like, well, that's Jesus, first of all. That's who Jesus is. That's what Jesus is about. He's about his love, about his abounding grace. And so, um, you know, and so I accepted Christ into my heart that night when I was 11. And from that point on, I was like, you know what, I'm going to live for Jesus. I said, I'm, I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to worship, and I'm going to sing all the songs and do all these things. And it's, my life is going to be so, so, so good but not realizing that God does promise us trials and tribulations. I feel like that's something that's kind of, you know, disregarded sometimes is we talk about how good God is and, and how amazing your life's going to be after forgetting that it's still life and we're still sinners and that we're still in a sinful world. And there's still things like cancer and there's still things like divorce and there's still fear. And we forget about those things. And that's okay because grace from God is abounding. It's never ending. There's never going to be a time where God's going to say, you know what, you haven't been to church in a while. I'm not really going to listen to your prayer. Because Psalm 6, 9 says, the Lord has heard my plea and the Lord accepts my prayer. The Lord accepts our prayers. He doesn't decline our prayers. He accepts our prayers. But here's the thing. He may not answer them in the way you want. He's going to answer them in a way that he knows is going to benefit us in the future. And that's the goodness of God. He knows what's good for us when we don't know what's good for us. And so, you know, growing up, um, I ended up actually living with um, my half-sister April and her husband and her family, um, even today. And so I, you know, I kind of lost that relationship with my parents. But by the grace of God, I had them. And so they're basically my parents now. And... Um, in, let's say, October of 2019, Gary, who he had become kind of my father figure, he kind of, you know, did all the dadly things, took me to father-daughter dances, and took me on daddy-daughter dates, all the fun stuff, right? Um, he was diagnosed with cancer. And I remember he told me that, and I said, the first thing I thought was like, no, I was like, why? I just said, why God? Why God did you allow such a great man to have such a horrible thing. But we forget that the disease doesn't define the person. And the disease doesn't define the creator either. It shouldn't define our relationship with the creator. So I lost that. Ju I said, just because you gave my dad cancer, I'm not going to follow you anymore. I'm not going to love you anymore. I'm not going to read your word anymore. 
forgetting that he was still standing right next to me the whole time I denied him. So I looked straight at the world and I said, I'm going to follow you. And Jesus is right here saying, follow me. Why are you not following me? I love you still. I still care about you. I never stopped caring about you. So then in March of 2020, um, I got a card from Gary and it was like, it said something like, you know, I can see you're not following Jesus. Why? He said, if I die tomorrow, are you still going to follow Jesus? Because here's the thing. I said I would follow Jesus and I said I would read my Bible, but I really didn't. I did it because he was dying. I did it out of guilt. I did it out of shame. And so I had a conversation with him later that night that he gave me that. And I said, you know what? You're right. I said, for these past five or six months or however long, I've been living in shame and guilt and doubt and fear and frustration. And I've been blaming it on the creator when it's a sinful, worldly thing. God didn't create cancer. God didn't say, oh, you know what? I'm going to give you cancer. God didn't just do that. That's because of our sinful world. That's why. And so, um, kind of coming back in, you know, I, he passed away in August of 2020. And so, even, you know, about a year later, it, obviously you're still going to have the grief and you're still going to have that struggle. But you have to realize that God doesn't leave. I know it's so easy to say that. It's so easy for me to stand up here and preach to you guys and say, it's easy, you know, God's never going to leave. God loves you forever because it's hard. And it's so much easier said than done, but I can't preach it enough. God doesn't leave. He leaves the 99 for us. He has 99 perfect sheep, perfect followers that are in his word every single day. And you're all the way over here. And he says, no, I want that one still. He says, I still want that one. I still want to follow that one. And so, guys, I, I want to encourage you tonight, if I leave you with anything, I want to encourage you to just run to him. Always. Even if you think you're too broken or you're too lost or, God, I, I watched this last night or I said this thing last night or I did this thing last night. It doesn't matter. God, God doesn't care. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and broken, and I will give you rest. He gives us rest, guys, because he loves us, and he's our father. We call him a father for a reason, because he never leaves. And I know, just like me, my biological father decided to leave and take out of my life, and then I got Gary, and then he was taken away. But the one father that never stayed was our heavenly father. He was the one father that was never taken away from me, guys. So I just want to encourage you with that. That's awesome, Gracie, how you went through all those tough times and those seasons, and you just, now you're, now you're you, it's just, it's awesome. Okay, so now we're going we're gonna to have a panel, like just a bunch of questions that people send in through uh, the Instagram DMs, and um, yeah, we're going to get the chairs out, and we'll get right started with that, and feel free to either talk to, um, you can come up or just ask one of us on stage if you really have a burning question that you just really want to ask, or any of those guys up there, um, you can just ask them. They'll bring it um, up to us. So, yeah. Are we good? Yeah. All right, we're going to do some introductions. Uh, I actually didn't introduce myself <laughs> earlier, but um, so I'm Noah. I'm from Clear Lake, Iowa. Um, pass on. Oh. I'm Faber. I'm from Minnesota. Faber Nache. <laughs> I'm Dominique. I'm also from Minnesota. I'm Aaron. Noah introduced me. I'm from Minnesota. I'm Faith Jerken. I'm from Johnston, Iowa. <laughs> oh, I forgot my phone. Oh, <laughs> Well, thanks for asking questions on our Instagram. If you did that, we're just kind of going to do like a panel um, to answer some of those. Yeah. 
All right, so our first question is, what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, to be a Christian, um, it means that you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, meaning that he has died on the cross to take your own sins upon him, and he was crucified. He died, and he was buried, and three days later, he, he, he rose from the grave. And um, trusting in that is how we are made right with God. And um, it says in Romans 5, 1, is that it says, Therefore, now that we've been justified, meaning made right, um, by faith, we have peace with God um, through our Lord Jesus Christ. So um, if you're a Christian, that means you are at peace with God. Um, and also with that, um, you know, being at peace with God, it's also your relationship with God is, you know, it's basically your Christianity um, because you can't, um, you know, call yourself someone who is a friend of Jesus Christ if you don't talk to him, you know, if you don't get in your word, if you don't pray um, because you don't have a relationship with him, you're not walking with him. Um, so that is a huge part of being a Christian, I would say, like definition, you know, walking with Jesus. Yeah, for sure. Um, I have some dad on to that. So just um, reading the word and living the word, just pre preaching it. So we're called to be disciples and we have a, just a perfect savior. He can forgive anything that we've done and we just got to remember that. Nobody's perfect. Um, second question. So what are some misconceptions about Christianity? Um, just like Noah just said, the misconception that Christians have to be perfect. Um, growing up, I thought Christianity was about checking boxes of going to church and serving and reading my Bible and praying, um, which those are all such great things, but it's also so much more than that. Um, none of us are perfect. If we were perfect, we wouldn't need God in our lives. Um, but also having the mindset of, I've seen the world, I've seen what the world has to offer, and I don't want that. I simply just want God. Um, being open and surrendering to everything he has for you. And yeah, we're not perfect in any way. And we're not encouraging you to be perfect because no, none of us are. Only Jesus is. And that's who fills in the hole for us. That's who bridges the gap for us. Yeah, I would say another misconception is that Christianity is for like a certain group of people. It is not. Um, like Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And last time I checked, the lost is not a specific group of people. We are all lost. We're all living in this sinful world. And we need to look to Jesus for like that salvation, that um, like ability to have like freedom in him and like that grace that he, that we get by having a relationship with him. All right, so we'll move on to question three. Uh, what has the church done wrong, and what can we as Christians do right? Um, I, I'll just start on this one. So um, something that either church or even Christians that they've done wrong is there's a lot of people that are forceful when preaching the gospel. They'll force it on people, and it's just you just really got to get to know people at a personal level. That they're going to want to hear you when you have that relationship. And if you're just saying, oh, do you know, do you know who Jesus is? This is who he is. Um, you just, you can't be so f forceful. So um, there's just been a lot of people that have been hurt or people that have been just straight up condemned. And that's just, as Christians, we just got to love them and then preach the truth and stuff once we feel called by God to be doing that. Um, alongside with what Noah said, I think um, something that the church does wrong is the fact that they think that they can change people. Um, we can change people. We think, you know, um, when someone walks in and they're so lost and they hear a few sermons and they're still not accepting Christ, oh my gosh, get them out of here. You know, they didn't pass the test. Um, and the, on the only person, the only one that can change um, someone's heart is the Holy Spirit. And so um, the church isn't patient, I would say, um, and honestly not obedient to what the Bible calls us to be. Um, and another thing that the church has done wrong is um, judgment. Um, I think 
with just being like, oh, this sin is worse than this sin. So yeah, they're like really bad people. Um, but the Lord says that we judge. Um, we're going to get judged as we judge. And so when we judge righteously, um, that's how it's going to be recipro reciprocated. Um, and so, yeah, it's something. I would say another thing is like, what is our intent when we are sharing the gospel? Are we doing it to bring attention to ourselves or to push our own agenda? Um, we see throughout history um, across the world, the gospel, not really the gospel because it's they weren't showing God's love, um, has been used to like oppress different groups of people. And that is not God's goal. And so we need to be aware of that hurt as we're going out and sharing the gospel. I think um, the, the culture, especially in America, has affected the Christianity of America instead of the other way around. Um, uh, the, the sin of idolatry, meaning that you are serving other gods or there's, there's something on, a pet, a, on a, the pedestal of your heart that isn't God. And um, I feel like that is what leads that to happen is, um, is when we let the culture um, influence how we look at God and how we look at the Bible instead of what the Bible actually says. Um, one more thing about something that Christians, I think, are doing wrong is so many people look at Christians um, and see Jesus. And as a Christian, my heart is every day to be more and more like Jesus. Um, but there's a lot of things that people will say that are hurtful, and people will get so hurt and completely shut out Christians, shut out the church, because that's then they put Jesus in their head as that label. Um, so you guys, and me as well, like all of us, your relationship with God has to be more than being at church or listening to us speak. Like, go figure it out for yourself. Um, being a Christian is more than the church. It's more than, um, yeah, listening to sermons. So go read the word. Go pray with him. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> Next question, what are some ways to break spiritually unhealthy habits and addictions? Matthew chapter five, verse 30 says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it far from you. Um, Jesus, yeah, cut, what did I say? Oh, no. Yeah, Jesus isn't telling you that you shouldn't have a right hand right now. Um, uh, he's, what he's saying is if there's something in your life that is causing you to, to sin and it's, it's, it's dragging you down, um, you know, whatever that is, you need to get it out of your life and get it away from you. Because, you know, if it's not there, it can't affect you anymore. Um, and addictions, um, you know... 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that no temptation has overtaken you um, that isn't common to, to man. So every single temptation, you know, it's, there's, chances are, you know, someone else has had that same temptation. And, um, and it says that God is faithful and, and he will always provide a way out of those temptations. And you just, um, in, that, in those situations, there will always be a way out of that temptation and um, it's up to you if you want to go back into that temptation or if you want to take that way out. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's hard, but, you know, you got to want it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, something for me, there was something that I struggled with for a really long time. Um, but for me, what really helped me find freedom was to tell somebody. Um, have someone in your life that you trust, that you can go to and talk to, that can keep you accountable for whatever your temptations are. Um, but also um, have someone that can like check in with you, even if it's just one person, someone that you trust, someone that is wise, someone that's in the word. Um, and I encourage you with that, that as they're checking in, just be honest, because obviously you can tell them, and then as they continue to check in over time, you can say, no, I don't struggle with this anymore, even though you do. Um, but seeing like the world or worldly temptations will never satisfy you. We get... Um, 
satisfied for moments and then we're hurt again. We end up broken, we end up empty and we continue going back to these. Um, but have someone um, that you can just be open with, honest with, that can keep you on track with what God has for you. Um, yeah, and I think scripture, you know, has the best answer for everything. In First Peter 5, um, 8, it says, be sober-minded. Um, I said this yesterday too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around you like a ro roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And that's exactly what Faith said. And um, it's so important to um, be able to share your suffering because God says that in our weakness, he is strong. So if you're hiding your weakness um, and you're th you think that you can do it on your own, um, you're demining the power of Jesus. And um, that's not okay. Um, so, and, and just know that whatever you're struggling with, whatever it might be, you're not doing it. It's, you're not the first person who's done it, and you're not going to be the last. Um, so just finding community and being open to coming to Jesus with your problems. Next question. What's the point of reading your Bible, worship, prayer? What does it practically look like to do those things? Um, short, simple answer, just all those things can get you a closer relationship with God. And just not doing it to just check off the boxes, but to actually like fully want to have the love of Christ and you just want to get closer to him. And while you're reading the Bible, you're, li you're literally reading Jesus' life. So it's just, and when you do that, you can become a better disciple to preach on to others. So. I'm going to have to pull up some scripture real quick. I got the Bible app. Okay. Okay. Romans 12, 1 to 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So our spiritual act of worship is, is you know, being available to God and being, being used by him, you know, um, giving your, devoting your life to him, you know, what he wants of you, you do that. You worship him in that. He is your Lord. He is your master, the, the, the owner of your life. And he gave you that life too. And so what's the least you can do by giving back to him and, and worshiping him? Um, when you accept Jesus, um, you know, you're accepting the fact that you believe in a savior who came and died for your sin. Um, and um, the only thing that he asks is a relationship and through that um, the only way to have a relationship with Christ is through prayers to is through reading your word um, and through like seeking community and stuff like that um, that's why it's so important because prayer and reading your Bible is like it's a direct um, wormhole <laughs> or like peephole I don't know um, to talking directly to the creator of the universe. Um, and so without that, you are unable to have this connection um, because I'm, I'm, you got friends, do you not talk to them? Like <laughs> you'd be texting them all day, all night, whatever, and this and that. And so you have this relationship with them and God calls us to have a relationship with him through these things. And so if you're not doing it, you really don't have a relationship with him. So that's why it's so important. Next question. How do you spread the word on social media as a Christian without forcing, forcing it on people? Well, that's the beauty of it. You just do it. <laughs> you, you can't force the word on anyone on social media because, you know, they, they don't have to watch it. You know, if, if they want to, they'll stay. And if they don't, it's gone. They'll never see it again. They can just block you. They can, they can, on TikTok, you can hold down the screen and say, not interested. You know, it's like, there is no such thing as forcing because it's not like I'm sitting you down and tying you down and say, listen to me and, and accept what I'm saying. No, I'm just, you're just offering it. 
like you would in person. You say, hey, if you want to, you know, how you scroll in person is you just walk away. That's all you do on, on social media. You can't force anything on social media. So, yeah, you, you just do it. Um, something else is we've kind of talked about surrender tonight a few times. Um, and so we surrender all these areas in my life and your lives. Um, but something I recently learned was I can surrender my social media to God. I can use this as a platform to glorify him in what I do. Um, the world and like adults see, not all adults, um, but we see social media as such a bad thing, such a negative thing, which it can totally be. But see it as an opportunity to glorify him. There's so many people that can be reached. Like that's how we connect with each other. I met so many of these people and keep in touch with like these people through social media. Um, it can be used for bad things, but it can be used to bring people to God, to just even plant a seed um, where people will be like, oh, this is important to them. Obviously, they're posting about it. It's on their heart, and that can just bring them to them straight away. And I think the important thing to remember is regardless if you're reaching one person or one million people, like God is using you to reach that person or those people, and that's like all you got to do because you're dedicating that platform or whatever it is you're doing to God to use you to reach people for him. Um, we just got to remember that God has a plan for everything and technology is here for a reason. And like Faith said, it's being used for a lot of bad things, pornography, all that kind of stuff. But what, what we have to do, like on TikTok, there's a lot of bad stuff on there. But what I see a lot of my friends doing, they're put, preaching out good content and um, it's just great how it's overflowing TikTok instead of all the bad videos. Um, and we're gonna go to our last, or anyone else? Oh yeah, anyone else before we go to our last one? Any questions? Any questions? All right. <laughs> um, so last question, what are ways that you draw closer to God? I mean, spend time with him and then spend time in community with people who will also encourage you to spend more time with him, dive into the word, have hard conversations with. The more time you spend, um, oh my word, the verse, um, bad company corrupts good morals. Yeah. So the more time you spend with like-minded Christians who are going to encourage you and build you up with your faith, in your faith, the more you are going to start living your life like Christ. But if you're spending less of your time with those type of people, then it's going to be often be harder. Like there's going to be more temptations. There's going to be um, more things that are going to make it stumbling blocks, et cetera. Anyone else? Can I just steal your Bible really quick? Yeah. You're opened up to like the passage I was looking for. <laughs> I'm looking for it. Hold on, someone else go while I look for this passage really quick. Yeah. Um, so my youth pastor one time, a few years ago, it's just always stuck with me, but she said, um, let's say you're in your room or you're in a room of your house and someone from downstairs yells up to you, um, someone from your family, and let's say it's your mom asking you to come downstairs. How do you know it's your mom? You guys can answer this. Like, how would you know it's your mom? Because you know her voice. You know her voice because you spend time with her. Um, you've spent time with her, you've grown up with her, and it's the same with God. We can't know God's voice unless we're reading his word, and just like they said, just like what Dominique was saying, um, spend time with him, get to know him, and that goes along, like this could go off into something else, but a question I always hear is, how do I know if this is God speaking this into my life, or how do I know if it's the devil? You guys, you'll know when it's God when you know his voice, and you know his voice when you spend time with him, and you draw closer to him. Um, did you find it, Aaron? I can keep going. Okay. Okay. No, you. It says somewhere in the Bible. <laughs> I can't find it. But um, it says to whatever is like good and holy and pure and godly, set your mind on those things. Fill your mind with the things of God, with scripture, with um, good messages, with encouragement. Um, and with that, with your mind on these things, you know. There's a lot less room for, for um, you know, sinful thoughts to come in and, and, and screw up your day. And, um, yeah. 
Um, and like alongside everything that they've said, um, it all comes to like a collective theme and it's guarding your heart. Um, in Ephesians 6, why did I say six like that? Six. I got a southern accent. Um, <laughs> um, in Ephesians 6, it talks about um, arming yourself with uh, the armor. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's because the devil is constantly coming to fight us. He's, it says the devil has come to steal and kill and destroy your life. He is coming to kill you every single day. And so God's like, put on the armor so you're protected. And um, when you do those things, when you read your Bible, when you're in your word, the devil can't come close to you because where God is, the devil cannot be in the presence of Jesus. Like, like that, I think that's something about sin that we don't really get is the fact that, um, like Faith said it, the closer we are with Jesus, the farther we are away from the devil. But um, there's, a, there's a different kind of presence when it comes with God. Um, like the devil is unable to be in the presence of God. Um, so when you're surrounding yourself with Jesus, you, <laughs> life's good man and like um, like it's just like yeah yeah for sure okay would you guys pray with me Jesus I just thank you so much um for people's hearts to just be bold and ask questions that they don't know the answers to God I thank you for you that all of the opinions in the world all of the things that the world throws at us God you know the answers Jesus we can be searching through all these different things, but God, you know. God, I thank you for using us as your vessels. Jesus, I just pray over the rest of this night as we get into sermons and messages and worship. God, everything we're about to do, Jesus, we throw everything away and you're still here with us. So God, take over this night. Um, have your way here. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you hear me? Oh. <laughs> We're going to transition into a time of messages. Um, so we have incredible speakers here to share the word with you. First up, we have David Ladding. He is from Atlanta, Georgia. He's been preparing an incredible word with you guys. Let's give it up for him. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Get my notes out. Hey, first off, I want to commend you guys for listening this long. Um, I know as a student, as someone who has been to church a lot, it can get tiring listening to a lot of people speak. Um, but I want to thank you for listening so intently and being respectful uh, this far. Okay, so I need to ask you guys a question. Um, but for this to work, you actually need to respond. I've asked this question publicly before, and I get a silent crowd, and it's really awkward. Um, so please, answer yell. Um, if you were to die tomorrow... What would you do? Treat mom nicer? Seriously, yell at me. Like, would you do anything? Worship. Worship. Okay. Reach out to everybody. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Come on. More people. Love people better. Share the gospel. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My boy. Um, for saying all that. Raise your hand if you have similar answers. Again, this is really important I do this. I know I'm like, this is like a third grade kind of thing. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Why don't you do that already? Why, why don't we do that already? We've heard a lot. <laughs> thanks, bro. We've heard a lot. We've heard a lot of amazing testimonies, a lot of amazing stories. And let me tell you one more. There was a boy, and his name was Clayton. His name was Clayton, and uh, he was speaking. To give you a little context on how I got to this message, uh, I'm a soccer player. I play soccer, and man, I used to grind so hard for it. It was my God. And I remember actually this year, um, a lot of stuff happened, but this year, I, um, I had a bad game. I don't even remember the score now, but I know I had a, a really bad game of soccer. And so I did what every normal teenage guy would do. I turned on a sermon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but in all seriousness, I saw this guy named Clayton, and he had a fedora on. I was like, I can't trust a guy with a fedora. Um, but I kept listening. Um, but it turns out it was in 2008. So this guy was giving a sermon. He was 18 years old. He was giving a sermon just like I am right now in 2008. And he said, when I was 16 years old, I was diagnosed with stage 2 brain cancer. And I beat it. Remember, I'm upset because of my soccer game trying to get encouraged. And so I hear this. I'm like, okay, let's, let's see where this is going, Lord. 
And then Clayton kept on speaking. He said, four months ago, I was diagnosed with stage four brain cancer. And I'm not going to make it. And at that moment, I realized I was listening to a dead man's sermon. I don't believe Clayton's with us anymore. I really don't. I looked at him. He was, he was weak. He was frail. He was, he was on the verge of death. He got asked a lot of questions. He said, the number one question I got asked, or I'm being asked is, Clayton, are you afraid of dying? Are you afraid of death? And Clayton's response was surprising. He said, it's the greatest gift the Lord has ever given me. The, the, the due date of my death is the greatest gift the Lord has ever given me. And I was hearing this while I was upset about a soccer game. This 18-year-old kid who died in 2008, 2009, was joyful about this suffering. And I was complaining like a child about a stupid soccer game. I don't even remember the score, and that was a couple months ago. This, this verse, it reminds me of Clayton's story. If you have your Bibles, flip open to Psalms 90, verse 12. And it says this. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The psalmist is saying here, teach me to number my days. God, let me know when I die so I might gain a heart of understanding and of wisdom. Guys, if we acted like every single day was our last, if we acted like every single day we weren't going to, to make it to see tomorrow, how, how much different would we act? Would we have to change the little things? Would we tell every single person about Jesus? And again, I'm going to rehearse that first question I asked. Why aren't we doing that already? We're not promised tomorrow. I don't know who told you that. Actually, I believe I do. I believe Satan told you that. See, in the West, we have this perspective that we live forever. That, that our home is here. And I'm specifically speaking to Christians, our home is not. I was at the, an evangelist yesterday, this really big guy in the faith. And he said, he said, our home is where our heart is. And many of my friends, their hearts are here. So let me ask you the question, where, where's your heart? Where are, you, where are you putting your heart in? Do you have this kingdom mentality, this, this, this perspective that this world will not last forever? Are you keeping that in your head, in your mind? See, something terribly scary is in the Bible. If you go to Revelation 4, I'm going to flip to it real quick. Give me two seconds. In Revelation 4, I'm going to read this passage really quick. So this is John, and he's in the throne room of God, Almighty God, okay? And he says this, Immediately I was brought in the spirit. Behold, a throne was set before me, and God sat there in jasper in this beautiful stone appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, an appearance of an emerald. And around the throne there were 24 thrones, and I saw 24 elders clothed on white robes, and they had crowns and gold on their heads. So I was with my friend Aaron. He gave his testimony earlier. I showed him a picture. It was this rainbow and a lightning bolt. It was a famous picture from National Geographic. And he said, David, that kind of looks like God. The rainbow, the, the, the peace, the, the love that we see. Jesus with a, with a little lamb that, that we're so often taught in church. But then the, the lightning, the power, the wrath, the justice of God. We're not often talked or, or taught about that, are we? But, but we see that characteristic being portrayed, this beautiful rainbow, right? The throne room of God. But in, but in verse 5, it says, In the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices with seven lamps of fire were burning on the throne. And the seven lamps were the spirits of God. Before, before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal in the midst of the throne. And around the throne, there were four living creatures with eyes all in the front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like a calf. The third creature had a face like a man. And the fourth was a flying eagle. And the four living creatures having six wings full of eyes all around and within. I don't even know what that means. And they do not rest day or night saying, holy, holy, holy. 
Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. So right now, as we are speaking, there is a God in heaven with lightning and thunder shooting out from his throne. These beings that I cannot even comprehend with six wings are just screaming, holy, 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 day and night, nonstop. In Revelation 5.11, it says 10,000 times 10,000 angels are worshiping God. A hundred million angels, these beings are screaming, holy, holy, holy. This is happening right now. If you believe in Jesus Christ, this is happening right now as we speak. And you will face that God. Just like Clayton did. Every single one of us are guaranteed one thing. That will be in front of God. In front of this throne. And it makes me think. What will will your response be? Many of us know the first response will be full of confidence, knowing that you ran this race with full endurance, persevering to the end, saying, I gave it my all. God, I sacrificed everything for you so I can come to you boldly. The second will be unbelief. Probably saying to themselves, oh, this is, this, this is really real. This God is really real, shaking, unable to speak, in utter fear. But the third option, a third option is actually, I believe, even more terrifying, is approaching the throne, knowing it was there the entire time and saying, I could have done so much more. I walked in this race called life. I didn't run. I knew Jesus, but I never said anything about it. I knew God. I want you to have this perspective. How many of your friends are unbelievers? Raise a hand if you know someone who does not know Jesus Christ. Look around you. Every single one of you knows someone who doesn't know Jesus. And the true reality is they're headed to hell. Separation from God forever. They're the second option, right? They're going to be in front of God saying, this was really real. I wonder, would they look at you and say, why didn't you ever tell me anything? You kept your mouth quiet about this, about this God. You knew that I would face him one day and you stayed silent. Why? Let me ask you a question. If you're silent about this God that we serve, you know he exists. You you know that this God sits on a throne with all of these beings. You know this God spoke a universe into existence. This God who can do anything and all things. This God who saved you. This God who gave you eternal life and your friend who will face him, you said nothing. Why? What will your answer be? Because you were too scared you were going to lose friends? Maybe they want to they talk to you anymore. You're willing to comfort someone to hell. I'd rather offend them to heaven. At least give it a shot. So that's real. Now sometimes I end with that and I walk off the stage and I I like to leave you guys thinking. But tonight I'm going to actually give you something even more. I'm going to give you application. I don't want you to walk away from this with just a fear of the Lord. I want you to walk away with this with the fear and love of the Lord. Because he's a good God. He gives us a second chance. (laughs) see Jesus called disciples we see that in Luke chapter 5 1 through 11 see Jesus a lot of people knew about him before he even started his ministry he was he was healing people people knew about him and one day Jesus is walking along the shore because Jesus walked like this just kidding. Okay, that was funny in my head. So Jesus was walking on the shore, and he saw these two guys fishing. And, he, and Jesus says, he says, just cast, cast out your net. Cast out your net. And the disciples say, they say, we haven't caught anything all day. Psh, you have no idea what you're talking about. Jesus, Jesus looks, looks at these guys. 
guy named Simon. And he says, just do it again, trust me. Just give it a shot. And Simon's like, whatever, fine. He throws out his net. And the fish, there's, there's so many fish. The boat starts turning and he has to get all of his friends and they're hurling fish on the sea, out of the sea, I'm sorry, onto the boat, right? So Simon just witnessed this miracle. And then Jesus says, follow me. And Simon says, okay. It says, so when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsake all. They, they, they forsook all things and followed him. Raise your hand if you know Jesus. You know Jesus. Have the mindset of the disciples saying, I have found the Messiah. The man we have been looking for for 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years. I have found him. And I'm going to tell every single person I know, Jesus is calling you right now. Maybe you don't share the gospel. And I think God is calling you right now to a higher standard. That voice cracked. To a higher standard. To a higher standard. Here, focus real quick, 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 quick. A higher standard. Guys, we're Christians. We're called to make more Christians. We're called to make disciples. When Jesus went back up to heaven in, in Matthew 21.8, he said, go make disciples of all the nations. I don't want to embarrass some of you, so I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand for this one. But have you ever made a disciple? Have you ever baptized somebody? Have you ever led someone to Christ? And in a lot of Americans' response, these, these, this Western church, they haven't. You guys haven't. You've just sat in these seats You've just listened to sermons. You've just taken notes. You said, wow, that was good. And you just do it again next Sunday. And I'm calling you. I say this because I love you. Make disciples. Do what Jesus is asking us to do. This God in heaven loved us so much. He came down to earth. And you have found the Messiah. So forsake everything. Nothing on this, on this planet matters. Lately, I've been getting uh, so much anxiety. Even the people I'm hanging around, they're saying, David, are you okay? And it's because I'm thinking, I'm getting so comfortable right here on this tiny little speck of a planet. It says in Ecclesiastes that this life is like dust in the wind. It's, it's so quick. Guys, Clayton died like that. My friend Aaron Different Aaron than this guy. I met him at a foot store three months ago. A foot store, a, a, a shoe store, sorry, that's weird. <laughs> a shoe store, I met this guy at a shoe store, okay? Here, focus, focus, focus. <laughs> so I met this guy at a shoe store. And we talked about Jesus, it was an amazing conversation. And his sister called me yesterday. This is a 28, 28 year old guy, he's really athletic, but he's been struggling with a meth addiction. And he woke his sister up at 5 a.m. with a knife. And I'm not even kidding you. During our mid-conversation, she gets another call and he got diagnosed with leukemia. My friend Jake Wanowski, he was my buddy, he was my friend. He was with his dad on a jet ski, on vacation. And a mishap happened and they just ran into a wall, dead. My pastor, my head pastor, died of COVID like that within two weeks. Last story, last testimony, there was a pastor and he said, legit, this really happened, I promise you. He, he rode a motorcycle all the time and he said, it's God's will if I get splattered on that free, you know, the free state wall, when you're driving down the free state, get splattered on that wall because someone didn't use their turning signal. He gave a message, like I am right now, about how, how our lives are so quick. And three hours after that message, after he gave that saying, after he boldly said in front of a congregation, my life doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I die on my motorcycle. He died on his motorcycle three hours later. There's even been pastors preaching sermons about Ecclesiastes, about how the life goes like that, and they've died mid-sermon. Guys, life is a gift. 
So I've been talking a lot. And again, I commend you for listening. But please take away this one thing, maybe two, maybe three, that our lives are quick, that we will face a God in heaven. But you know the Messiah, and he knows you. So what are you going to do about that? David, thank you. Um, what's up, guys? My name is Jacob. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm going to be giving the second sermon today. Um, I'm going to be talking about two things, and I have a challenge for you guys, and it's to really apply everything that I say and put it into your own, your own lives, okay? So the first thing I'm going to talk about tonight is running the race that God has set before us. So I want you to take just a picture of your life right now and ask yourself, what race am I running? What race am I running? What does my finish line look like? I don't know about you, but obviously we all struggle with things. In high school, I struggled with pornography. I was a lukewarm Christian. I put on this mask all the time. Everybody thought I was this goody two-shoes kid who came to school, did his schoolwork, went home, played sports, and that's it. Everybody thought I was running this race for God, but in all reality, I was running this race for something that's never going to fulfill me. So my first question is, what race are you running? Once you have that in your mind, let me ask you something. What pace are you running this race at? Because when I was chasing lust with all my heart, I was sprinting towards that. I was sprinting away from God. I had... No desire in my heart to have anything to do with my heavenly creator. Not one desire. But you know what's crazy? He ran after me even harder. He ran after me and said, my child, my child, I want you. I love you. I can use you. You see, we're all these broken vessels, right? We're these broken vessels. But we allow the Lord to use us and to shine his light through us and say, no, 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 no. Your story is going to impact all these people. So maybe your story is kind of like my story. Maybe somebody in here has also struggled with lust a lot and you've kept quiet. Everything you need to do and what he has called you to do is already in you. It's all this mindset of when you're going to figure out what is the Lord really calling me to do? You see, I'm going to ask you a question. If we were supposed to be taller, would the Lord have made us taller, yes or no? Yes. If we were supposed to be faster, if we were supposed to be smarter, the Lord would have implied that. He would have brought it into our life and it would have been made nature. So you know what? We need to stop about the complaining of the things that the that the God of the universe has not given us, but instead focus on what he has given us. You see, we, we get so distracted by what if? That we can't even see what it is. We get so distracted on the things that we don't have, we can't even see the things that we do have. I don't know about you, you, but this morning I woke up and I said, thank you. Thank you, Lord, because guess what? Not everybody gets that luxury. Clayton didn't get that luxury. My grandpa four years ago didn't get that luxury. I'm sure you guys have family members who all of a sudden pass away, you never see them again. I want you guys to open to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And as you open, um, it's, it's talking about this race that I'm talking about right now. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance before the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand in the throne room of God. 
David talked about it, the throne room of God, where 10,000 times 10,000 angels are praising his name, holy, 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 who was and is and is to come. And I think the one, the one part of this verse that I always just look past is that in verse 2 it says, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And you know, we, we might look at this and say, okay, yes, Jesus carried the cross on his back and he was crucified on, on the cross, but what does that mean? Because to me that means 2,000 years ago, our past, our present, and our future sins he put to death. And we think about this battle, right? And we're like, how can we win this battle? Well, let me tell you, my friend, this battle was already won. Because Christ put all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our guilt to death 2,000 years ago. So if you feel like this little voice in the back of your head saying, hmm, that's me. Let me ask you something. What are you going to do about it? Because your past, my friend, does not define you. We all have our own stories. But we are never too far from God. Never too far from God. And the second thing I'm going to talk about is the courage to go ahead and let go of your past. I, I was watching this sermon the other day and um, somebody said this. I don't remember their name. Um, it says, denial is not forgetting your past. Running away from your past is not forgetting your past. At some point, there has to be a conscious decision in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, in your soul, saying where I'm going to, to face my past and let go of it and lay a hold of the future. When and where I'm going to do that is up to you. But guess what? That future, that's not your future. That is the future that Jesus has set aside for you since the day you were created in your mother's womb. When are you going to let go of your past? And when are you going to grab a hold of the Lord's arms and run straight after the future that Jesus has for you? I, I get reminded all the time of the story where Peter is walking on water, right? And Jesus says, Peter, Peter, just keep your eyes on me and you'll be okay. And so Peter takes a step off, off into the boat and, and he's, he's on the water and he has his eyes on Jesus, but he gets nervous, he gets scared, right? So he starts to look down at the waves. And as he looks down at the waves, he begins to start sinking. And you see so many times in our lives, we, we look down at the waves. The waves represent our anxiety, our lust, our depression, our greed, whatever it is, whatever you're struggling with. And what do we do? We sink. We fall away from God when God's saying, keep your eyes on me and you'll be okay. I will guide you through this storm. I will pull you inch by inch by inch so you can make it through. But so easily when we, do, we just say, no, God, I'm scared. I don't want to. And I want to say something that's true and that's real and that applies to our everyday life. And I guarantee somebody in here is dealing with it. And is that we take all of our guilt, all of our shame, and we don't talk about it. We don't even talk to our heavenly creator about it. The one who can forgive us for everything. And without that, there is no healing. There is no letting go of that and turning to the Lord. When we're, when we're here and we're holding on to something and Jesus over, is over there and we have this one thing that feels so good, we want to turn to him, but we just can't. We still hold on to it. You're never going to have a whole relationship with the Lord. But once you let go and you turn your eyes on Jesus, he can set you free, he can break those chains, and he can use you for his glory. And, and don't get me wrong, guys. We are not perfect people. We're not. And we're going to fall time and time again. And that's why Jesus died on the cross for us. But when we, when we learn to have this heart of conviction and reconciliation and saying, Lord, I am sorry, but I am so deeply in love with you. And for what you did for each and every single person on this planet 2,000 years ago, I'm going to drop everything I have and turn to you. Because I don't know about you, but I have a perfect Savior who died for imperfect me. If you guys have your Bibles, open up to Galatians 5. In Galatians 5, chapter, er, chapter 5, verse 16, it says, I say then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And it goes on to list the lust of the flesh. And, and, and among these are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissension, heresies, envy, 
envy, murders, drunken revelries, and much the like. And that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Whoa. I don't know about you guys, but the first time I read that, my jaw literally dropped. And I felt conviction right away. And guys, I'm not here to scare you, but I'm here to wake you up. Because I want to see each and every one of you one day in that throne room, worshiping the Lord with me. But then he goes on to say the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith can faith and control, gentleness, against all and such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh, put it to death with its passions and its desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. When we crucify the flesh, when we say, guess what, Lord, you are bigger than me. The, the things that this world has to offer will never fulfill me. When you put that to death, when you cut off your right hand and you give your life to the Lord, I promise you, the love that he has for you will fill your, fill your body, fill your, this temple that you have. I, I can't even put it into words. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. I'm going to leave you with this. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ so we can do the good things that he had planned for us long ago. I'm not coming here to sit in front of you guys and say you're doing this, this, and this wrong. But man, I'd encourage each, each and every one of you tonight, I don't know what it is that you're holding on to. I don't know what it is that you haven't told somebody about, you haven't told your heavenly creator about. But he has had this heavenly plan set apart for you since the day you were born. Since the day he conceived of you in his mind. So as I pray, as I pray us out here, I want you to think about that one thing and what you're going to do and if you're going to give that to the Lord or if you're going to hold on to it. And I want you to sacrifice that, that to the Lord saying, Lord, set me free from my sin. Set me free from my sin. Lord, we, we thank you for the time that you've allowed us to come together today. <laughs> None of us are perfect, Lord. And I just want to pray that you would fill each and every single person in this room with peace, that you would touch their hearts. We are all broken people, Lord, but you are a perfect Savior who died for imperfect me, for imperfect us. And as we go about our day, as we go about our night, as we continue to hear the rest of the sermons and the worship, Lord, just touch our hearts. Allow the, allow the Holy Spirit to fill our beings. Now, if we have anything on our hearts to cry out to you and say, holy, 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 there is none like you. Lord, we thank you for the time that we've had here. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. In your holy, almighty name we pray. Amen. Oh my gosh, it's so sensitive. Why so sensitive? <laughs> well, hello. Um, <laughs> let me take my glasses off. Um, I actually have 20-20 vision, um, so just wear them for show, whatever. <laughs> um, but <laughs> my name is Favor Nache. <laughs> chill out, chill out, chill out. No, 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 no. Please, please, please. Thank God, thank God. Um, but my name is Faber Nache, and I'm 17 years old. I just graduated high school, so I'm feeling, yes, I'm feeling very, feeling very liberated is the word I would use. Um, but I'm going to college in a few weeks, which is super exciting. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm just 17. But um, at a young age, I came to a realization that I had to work for the love that I seeked. 
you know, we all seek love and stuff like that. But I was like, man, no one's gonna love me for me, so I have to add on to me. Whether it be funny favor, gift giving favor, charismatic favor, it didn't matter. I had to be something more than myself for me to, you know, get this love from people. And so, um, something in my life that I took for granted was the love that my parents had for me. You know, I mean, oh, cliche, yeah, your parents love you, duh. But like, I never really noticed that I didn't do anything to deserve their love. You know, we're just born and they just love us and they just care for us because, you know, we're their child and they just love us. And even though my parents aren't perfect, the love that they showed me reminded me of this love called God, God's love. And um, God's love is this perfect love that literally sent his son to die on the cross, to die from, uh, to take away my sin. And so um, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So what is grace? I don't know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I do know. Um, grace, as defined by Webster, Merriam-Webster, you know, dictionary, is the unmerited love in favor of God toward human beings. Grace can also be defined as getting what we absolutely do not deserve. Jesus in the New Testament is often referred to as Yeshua. Well, it's a big word. No, it just means Jesus in Hebrew. And it literally translates to to save and to rescue. So if we are saved by grace and Jesus is our savior, then that can only mean that we are saved by Jesus alone because Jesus is grace. Come on. So what is this thing that we don't deserve but we freely get by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, let's go back to the beginning. Let's take it back. Let's take it back. The story of Adam and Eve and the apple. To be honest, I really admire the apple because it uh, gives me main character vibes. You know, because it's all about the apple. Eve ate the apple and then sin came into the world. But that's exactly what happened. When um, the snake came and the devil deceived Eve, she fell prey to sin and sin entered the world. Because sin divides us from God and God is the source of life, when we are, when sin separates us from God, we are spiritually dead. You know, we no longer have that eternal life that God intended for us. And some people are like, okay, why can't God still love me? Like, why can't he just love me even though, like, I sin? Well, the thing is, sin stains. You can't expect to go and hug someone who's covered in mud and stay clean. Like, what are you, Mr. Clean? Like, it's just not going to work. And so because we are stained with sin, it is impossible for God to have a relationship with us, you know? Because, like, God is a spotless God. He is a blameless God. He is a holy, pure God who is incapable of being in the presence of sin. He cannot have relationship with sin. That would go against everything that he stands for. In the Old Testament, we see the temporary fix in which God provides for his children. You know, he's like, when you sin, you pick a day in which you're going to uh, do an animal sacrifice. And so we see that this temporary fix is not really saving these people. It's just giving them a way to pay for their sins. You know, they sin all weekend. They're like, hmm, it's time to pay for my sins. <laughs> Let's get, the, let's get the sheep on the bus, you know, and then we're going to cut off his head, and then boom, our sin is paid for. But because God knew that was a temporary fix, in his divine appointment in Matthew 28, we see the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Woo! I thought you guys were going to leave me hanging. Man. We see the death and resurrection of this guy called Jesus. See, now, people don't really understand, some, some people don't really understand why death was needed, you know, in the case of our sin. In Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. What does that mean? It means the price of sin is death. There is nothing else that can take away sin but death. And it has to be the death of a perfect Savior. It had to be the death of a perfect Savior. Okay, so now we know what grace is and, you know, 
now you know who grace is. But how can I get that grace? Where can I get that grace? Well, in Ephesians 2, 4, 5, it reads, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Everybody said, by grace, you have been saved. Huh. Even in our trespasses, even in your depression, even in your anxiety, even in your loneliness, your miserableness, God sent Jesus to come and save you from that. Like a, like a superhero. And there's nothing, there's, no, there's nothing you have to do to earn that grace. There's nothing you can give to earn that grace. All he says is believe. That doesn't seem fair. Jesus died on the cross, and all I've got to do is be like, I believe you did that. What? Isaiah 64, 6 says, even our righteous acts are like filthy rags. You can think of the most perfect person in your life. You can think of the most, you know, goodest person you've ever met in your life. Even their life cannot earn the kingdom of God. I want to talk to you a little about um, Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 2.10, because we usually talk about 8 and 9, but we leave 10 because, you know, 8 and 9 is like, by grace you have been saved. Woo! You are, when you believe, you are entered into the kingdom of God. But 10, 10 talks about what you got to do after that. Ooh, people don't like to talk about that. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk with him. Mm, that's an interesting word, walk. See, the acceptance of grace and salvation does not just stop at acceptance. You're not just like, I believe you. Then you're like, yeah. No, it says we have to walk with Jesus. Everybody say walk with Jesus. For example, there you see my really good friend, Faith. We met about a month ago. And, you know, I was like, Faith, I love you so much and I want to be your friend. And so since then, we've been talking, we've been having relationship, we've been, you know, you know, talking on a daily basis because of that love that we have for each other. Because we were like, you know what, I'm going to have a relationship with you. It is impossible for me to have a relationship with Faith if I don't talk to her. That don't make no sense. It is impossible for me to know faith if I don't talk to her. So it is important to know that Jesus is not only salvation, but he is also our journey. He is also our relationship that we have with him. Daily relationship. So every day, you know, you get, I get to wake up with this, with this everyday grace, with this everyday love, and all that he asks is this everyday relationship. All that he asks is that you come and you talk to him. You come and you bear your sins. You, you just take it all to him because that is all that matters. You spend so much time doing all these things, and, and, and Jesus is just like, just come talk to me. That's all I want from you. It is said nothing is free in America. Amen, yeah. America's expensive place to live. Um, but the truth is the most precious thing in the entire world is free. But not only is it free, it is freeing. It comes with a bonus package. It is freeing of your burden. It is freeing of the things that you carry. The things that you carry, and you're like, I gotta, I, I, I gotta deal with this. I gotta deal with that. My, my parents got divorced last week. I gotta deal with that. Somebody died last, that last year. I gotta deal with that. I have to do this. I have to do that. No, you don't. Jesus died on that cross, so you don't have to go through that. Jesus took your sin, so you don't have to bear that burden. Do you understand that? When you accept Jesus, you accept that your sin died alongside with him and you were resurrected into new life when he resurrected three days later. Hmm. <laughs> ain't, that, ain't that a good thing? Don't we serve a good God? So I ask you, have you heard of this gospel? This good news that whew, you can live a life and yes, we still sin. 
Yes, we still face tribulation. We still face trial. But we face it with a perfect God. And we face it with a God who says, even though you are in this sinful nature, I am still coming and I am still saving you. And he saves us every day. When you accept God, when you, when you accept Jesus, it is not just that one day where you accept him. It is every single day you have to keep on accepting him because it is every day he continues to save. You are renewed every single day. It's funny how, how uh, you know, the day works. You wake up, go to sleep, you get to wake up again. And you got to wake up, go to sleep, you got to wake up with Jesus. You got to go to sleep with Jesus, you got to wake up with Jesus again. Jesus has chosen you and he is waiting for you. The king, the king of the universe, the, the one who created this world, the one who created you. He is waiting for you. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus is like, it's for everybody who wants it. If you are lost and want to be found, he is like, come on. There is many seats at this table. It don't matter how far you think you've gone. It don't matter the worst thing you've ever done in your life. Jesus is like, I, I already died for that. So I don't know what you're doing. Like, the, the, it's already been paid. It's already been paid. So what you doing? Everybody is welcome. There is rejoicing happening right now in heaven. There's rejoicing that's already started. Come on, y'all gotta listen to me. There is rejoicing that has already started in heaven for you. So won't you accept this salvation? Won't you accept this free gift? Shoot, if somebody give me a free gift, I'm accepting them. <laughs> I don't gotta pay for it. Sure, give me that gift. And if you've, if you've heard of this gospel, but you haven't been walking in it, I'm telling you that God sees you and he wants you. You're his child. You're his daughter and you're his son. He wants you. He loves you. He craves relationship with you. Everybody bow your heads and pray, please. Father, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this beautiful day in which you've brought your beautiful... Um, children, Lord, here. Um, I thank you so much, Lord, for who you are. Thank you so much that we are able to have the opportunity to even speak your name. Lord, I thank you so much for every single person seated in these seats. Lord, we know that you have a divine appointment. And Lord, we know that none of us are here by mistake. So Lord, I thank you so much. Lord, for your mysteriousness. <laughs> I thank you so much for your grace, your mercy that you show us every single day in which you, you just ask us to have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray for those in the, in, in that are seated, Lord, who are hurting. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you meet them where they are at. And Lord, I just pray, Father, for every single person who has decided to come here. Lord, I pray that you bless them. And Lord, that you continue to teach every single one of us of this gospel, this good news that you sent Jesus to die for our sins, to take away our sins. It is a beautiful thing to worship you, Lord, and I thank you so much for everything that you have done, you're doing right now, and you continue to do in our lives. For in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Wow, amen. Can we give it up for our speakers that we've had tonight? So good, so good. Awesome. So um, in Matthew um, chapter 18, it talks about the parable of the wandering sheep. So I'm going to read it. If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, 
He is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. So you guys, obviously the one sheep got lost from a shepherd. How do you think he got lost? He got distracted. He took his eyes off of the shepherd. So I don't know what you've been getting distracted with in your life, what you've been turning for the world um, to satisfy you, to fill you up. You guys, God's right there. He will chase after you. If you're the only person in this room, the only person in this world, God would still take your place on the cross. He would still die for your sins. He would still pay the price for you. We get so caught up in looking in the groups and looking at everyone around us. What's that person doing? What's he doing? What she's doing? Are they looking at me? Are they watching me? God's heart is for the one. God's heart is for the one. So as we get into altar call time, I'm going to invite Jordan up. Um, he's our founder of How to Life Movement. Um, he's incredible. Yeah. Thanks, Faith. All right, well, before we get into a time of worship, I want to kind of just conclude this segment where we've been talking about uh, the gospel. We've been talking about what it means to follow Jesus. And you, know, you guys have just had a chance here to hear from favor uh, and from faith and from so many people tonight. Uh, let's give a quick round of applause for everyone who's shared tonight so far. There have been some amazing stories of young people here that have been talking about what it means to follow Jesus. And you guys might be here wondering, okay, what is How To Life? And like, that's cool. And it's the name of kind of the movement of, uh, of many of us coming together from Gen Z and telling others about the hope that we have in Christ. And, uh, but it's also really cool because How To Life represents how to do life. So as we kind of wrap up here, I want to share just a little bit about what it means. How to do life. What does it mean to life? How to life. So basically, I'm going to share how, what it means how to do life. Uh, each and every one of us are created for a relationship. Now we, uh, God created each and every one of us. There's a relationship we're created to have. The Bible says uh, that all things were created by him and for him. God made each of us so that we can be in relationship with him. That's why God made us. But there's a problem. There's a problem, and it's sin. Sin has separated us from God. What is sin? Well, sin is us running our own life, saying, God, you run the universe, but I'm going to run me. I'm going to run my life and do things my way. And the Bible says that there's a death penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death. And the Bible says that death means being separated from God eternally in a place called hell. But there's some good news. We, this relationship that we were created to have, but that we don't have because of sin, is a relationship that we can have. This is the good news of the Bible. It's the hope that you've been hearing about tonight. We have good news. We have hope because of Jesus. Jesus himself, God sent his son Jesus to come to earth to pay the death penalty that we deserve to pay by dying on the cross and to take our sins. Everything that we've done in our life went on Jesus when he died on the cross. When he was nailed to the cross, it's so important to remember that what Jesus did was for me, was for you. I love the verse John 3, 16. Most of us in here probably know it. You might not either way. I'll just share it real quick. Uh, it's for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. And that's so, so important. You shall not perish but have eternal life. And I want you to put your name in there. For God so loved your name that he gave his one and only son that if your name believes in him, then your name would not perish, but have everlasting life. But this relationship that we're created to have, that we don't have, that we can have, is one that we must choose. We must come in to that relationship and place our faith in Jesus, give our life to Jesus. And what does that look like? It looks like grabbing onto Jesus like he's your one and only hope. Like a drowning person grabs onto a lifeguard saying, Jesus, I'm yours. So if, if we could just for a moment here, if everyone wouldn't mind bowing your head and closing your, closing your eyes. 
we just kind of want to have a time of reverence here as we finish this segment. I want you to picture this. I want you to picture you're on a beach. And Jesus is also on this beach with you. And he's standing on this beach. And he has drawn a circle. And he's in this circle. He's drawn a circle in the sand. And he's inviting you to come and to step into this circle. He's inviting you to come and to come into the family of God. I want you to picture this. And I want to invite you tonight. We, you maybe came here tonight and you're wondering, okay, I don't know where, I, where I'm at in life and what is going on or why God has me here. You might have a, a story of like, could God really love me? I'm an imperfect human who has done so much. Could God really forgive that? The answer is yes. God has forgiven our sins. Jesus has conquered death. So I want to invite you tonight, if tonight, if you want to make this a new beginning in your relationship with Jesus, or if you want to declare a new beginning with Jesus, or maybe for the first time you want to come into a relationship with Jesus, with God, with the God of the universe who created you and wants to have a relationship with you, to spend eternity with him. If you want to get clean, if you want to be forgiven, if you want to declare a new beginning in your walk with Jesus tonight, I want to invite you to pray something like this after me, just in your heart. These are no magic words. Magic words will not get you into heaven. But I'm going to pray a prayer here. And if you want to, in your heart, pray something like this. Jesus just wants to hear from you, from your heart, and from what? From, for you to cry out to him. Pray something like this after me, just in your heart, quietly. Lord, I've been running my own life, but that is over as of today. I've been living for me. I'm sorry for my sin, but I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, paid the death penalty that I deserve to pay. Jesus, I want a relationship with you. I want you, I want to get to heaven someday with you. And I'm going to declare that my life is yours. From today on, Jesus, I'm yours. I just want to take a few seconds here and keep it quiet for you to do business with God in your heart. night for you, if that was the first time that you've prayed a prayer like that, the first time that you've in essence said, Jesus, I am yours. I want you. I want you to come into my life. I want to declare myself all in for you. If tonight was the first night, I want to ask you, um, with no one looking around, just keep your head bowed. Could you just raise your hand just quickly? Tonight was a new beginning for you in your relationship with Jesus. Wow, I see you. I see you. Thank you. Wow, wow. Well, as we're finishing here, what I want to invite you all to do as well uh, is, is to have a chance to publicly respond We've got a cross up on the screens here just to represent Jesus. If tonight for you this was a new beginning in your relationship with Jesus, if you want to get clean, if you want to be forgiven, if you want to declare that new beginning with Jesus, uh, in Matthew, Jesus says that he who acknowledges me before man, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And he who denies me before man, I will deny before my Father in heaven. But if tonight was a new beginning, yeah, those of you that raised your hand in any of you, we want to keep it quiet here for a second. I want to invite you to do something bold and to come to the front, like right down here, and kneel in front of the cross and declare this new beginning with Jesus. 
tonight for you was your night where you said, Jesus, I'm yours. I want this relationship with you. I want you to change my life, transform my life. I want eternal life with you, and I want to spend eternity with you. I want to invite you to come forward. Neil, right here at the cross. I'm going to keep it quiet for a second. We're not going to wait super long. If you want to come, come now. Well, we're going to have some of our team here at the front that can talk with you if you need prayer or if tonight, if you have questions like, who is Jesus? I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to declare that he is Lord of my life. The Bible says that he, if you confess with your mouth, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that you'll be saved. It's that simple. It's so amazing. And if tonight, if you made a decision like that, we want to talk with you. If we could have some of our team come up to the front and just kind of be here to have the conversations, we'd love to talk with you. We would love to pray with you here tonight. Um, and uh, feel free. Once again, if you want to come, there's still time. You can come down. We can, we'd love to pray with you uh, here and now as we start worship. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to the worship team. Thank you all. For those of you that did, raise your hand. It was a new beginning. Let's give you all a hand just for making that decision tonight. Thank you all. We'd love to talk with you. We'll be up here. We'd love to pray with you. I'm going to pass this over to the worship team and let them lead us in a few songs here at the end. I'll invite y'all to stand. Thanks, Prince. Let's go.
are going pretty good um we could say that we may be on like a spiritual high and may have may have a hard time finding something even to cry about or pray about i pray that those of us who feel that way right now god that we will just intercede on behalf of those who aren't strong enough on their own god that we will just come beside our brothers and sisters and lift them up in prayer god that's why you've given us this body of believers, not so that we would run as individuals, but that we would all run alongside each other together, continually building one another up. And so, God, I just pray that tonight um, people's lives and hearts would be changed. And that whether it's a closer relationship with you um, or continuing to grow closer with those in the church and working towards finding that that fire again for you, God. I pray that each person will just understand the reason why they're here tonight. And so we just give you all the glory and we thank you.
Do it again
won't be the only night that we talk to you, that we talk to other believers, and that we desire to be filled up and set on fire for you, God. So I pray that even as we leave tonight, as we go to bed, or whatever we decide to do later, God, I pray that you will just go with us and help us to remember that our purpose is to glorify you only. And that this life, it says in 1 Timothy to fight the good fight that is set before us, God. So help us to fight. And thank you that this battle isn't against flesh and blood, but you are fighting our battles for us, God. And so help us just to remember that, and just to grab hold of your hand and to let you lead. So God, thank you so much for tonight and for this amazing church allowing us to do this here and just for meeting us right where we're at, God. Thank you so much for who you are. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, real quick, we're going to invite Jordan up here to give just kind of an overview of what How to Life is and if y'all want to get involved. Jordan, Jordan. Super quick, you guys are awesome. Yes, yes. All right. Have you guys been enjoying tonight? Yes. Well, I want to thank you all for coming out to How to Life tonight in Des Moines area. This is our first ever in Des Moines. So, yes, first ever How to Life event in Metro Des Moines area. We're so glad that each of you came to this. Uh, feel free to take a quick seat. We'll be done uh, here in just a quick minute. Um, uh, but yeah, so this has been really, really exciting. We had an event last night in Clear Lake, Iowa, and last night was actually the 100th ever How to Life Movement event, and which makes tonight number 101. That's also cool. Uh, so uh, there have been 101 completely Gen Z-led How to Life Movement events that have happened now all over the world in six countries in 21 states. And I'm Jordan Whitmer. I'm the founder of the How to Life Movement. Uh, How to Life started in my hometown in Arkansas six years years ago when I was a junior, when I was 16, and I said, God, I want to do something more to reach my friends for Christ, but I don't know how. I don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, and I prayed, and God led me to say, hey, you know, what if you could plan an event to share the gospel with Gen Z? Uh, and me being on the older end of Gen Z, being 22, uh, well, back then I was also 16, so when I was 16, I was like, hey, I want to do something more. We started an event. We shared the gospel at the event that we did in northern Arkansas in my hometown and it was just so powerful. Tons of people were impacted and this has now grown into an international movement uh, with events in over 21 states and six countries including the UK, Germany, France, Mexico, Canada, all these places with young people saying we want to do something to reach our generation. Uh, some of you guys might not know, but our generation is uh, very lost. There are a lot of people in our generation that don't know what it means to follow Jesus. Uh, the statistic that came out not long ago, just a couple years ago, was that for Gen Z, Gen Z is the least Christian generation in American history. Only 4% of teenagers in the U.S. today having a biblical worldview, which is really sad and really sobering. That's only one in 25 people that you meet on the street from Gen Z that's a teen in America probably knows what it means to follow Christ. But there's good news, and that good news is that the 4% is very strong, and you've seen people here tonight, the leaders, and many of you that are part of that 4% saying, hey, we want to see our generation change. We want to get hope to our generation. So that's really the mission of the How to Life movement, is reaching and discipling and mobilizing our generation for Jesus Christ, uh, because he is our only hope. You've heard many stories tonight of how Jesus has changed our life. He is our hope, and he's our creator, and he's who we want to live for. And uh, that's really the heart and passion of this movement. If you want to get involved in the How to Life movement in some way. Do you guys want to see something like this happen again sometime? Yes. Well, we would love to see something continue here in the Des Moines area. We'd love to see stuff continue in Iowa. If you're from another part of Iowa, any of you come from out of state? Anyone from out of Iowa that's here? Who? Where are you from? Minnesota. Yes. 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 Uh, anybody drive over an hour to get here? Yes, yes. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you all for driving down and coming all this way. If you all want to see something like this happen in your town, like reach out to us, reach out to the How to Life Iowa page or How to Life Movement on Instagram. We'd love to stay in touch and just see what could maybe happen. Uh, and if maybe you want to help lead or start something like this, our heart is just to see us step up boldly and say, 
God, use me, here am I, send me, and to fulfill the great commission of making disciples in our areas and to help be a voice for our generation and to help get people connected in with amazing churches. And there's so many people in our generation that need discipleship and mentoring and, uh, and, and community. So also, let's give a big round of applause to North Point here for hosting us. Thank you to the North Point team for staying up with us tonight on this Saturday night. We so appreciate you all. Uh, thank you very much. It means so much uh, that you all could host us and, uh, uh, for this evening. Um, we'd love to connect with you briefly afterwards. I do know we do need to get out of here probably at a certain time because they have church here uh, tomorrow because it is a Saturday. Yes, it is. So, um, uh, But thank you all so much for coming. We'd love to talk to you. and. Uh, uh, we are praying that God will continue to move here in Des Moines. Let me pray real quick. God, be with us in each and every person here. Pray that you would move in Gen Z, that you would move in Iowa, and that the gospel would go forth, and that there would be revival and awakening that happens amongst the young people uh, in Iowa. And we just praise you and thank you and are so grateful for who you are, for how faithful you are. Be with us today as we head out tonight and the rest of this weekend. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you all for coming.